Hey, hey, welcome back to Over the Horizon. We're going to try a new format today. We're going to uh, try and get a roundup of everything as, as much as we can. There's so much happening in space uh, this year. Um, it's going to be a watershed year, but we're going to look at it week by week. We'll try and get you the highlights. Um, so this is kind of the first attempt at it on Over the Horizon. And uh, with us is uh, the OG, Scott Walter. We also have uh, Ben, Ben Inouye, who's uh, in a way from uh, NASA JPL. And of course, Ozan Belik. Uh, it's great to have you guys back together. It's been a while. Uh, lots to talk about. Um, so let's focus uh, straight away on what we're looking at. This week, we're going to talk about Starship IFT4. A lot happening on that front, Boeing Starliner there too, and the Sierra Space Dream Chaser. Scott and I had a, a bit of a chat yesterday about um, the bugs and fixes report that SpaceX got out for IFT3. Um, we're now looking at IFT4, the window opening on the 5th of June. Um, before we get to Ben's and Scott and uh, Ozan's um, quick thoughts about where we're headed. Uh, Scott, is there anything that you'd like to add to what we were talking about yesterday? Well, I, mean, I guess the, the quick thing is we were just expecting to get a launch date and then we got a bit more information that was unexpected. There were two items that jumped out at me and I just want to ask Ozan, do those two items jump out for you as well? And uh, do you know which ones I'm talking about? Well, I don't know, maybe it is different. Okay, the first one was like the, the reason why the, the attitude of, um, of of the Starship in, in, in orbit, why it was kind of not they're, they lost control of it, and it had to do with the thrusters being clogged. And I'm like, or the valves being clogged. I'm like, wait a minute, how, how do you get that clogged? And whether you had some thoughts about it, because I was speculating. I, I I'd heard beforehand that, that that's what had happened. Yeah. yeah. And the same I, thing I, with the I landing. I conflicting uh, information about why that's happened. So um, yeah. I don't know if we'll ever get the, the full story. but And it seems like yeah. they partially fixed the filters for the, the oxygen intake on the on the booster, and they had the same problem. So they, they partially fixed it. There was a problem there. And then the other thing is like the jettisoning of the hot ring. It's yeah. like, okay, what are your thoughts? Why would they go to the length of jettisoning that considering that it's, it's adding extra complication? Yeah, so I mean, it seems like so. So one thing that's that's been noted is that it's it's not being jettisoned before boost back, uh, which mm -hmm. makes sense because boost back is basically like a continuous uh, uh, burn. You you don't you don't have the the booster engines completely yeah. shutting down. Uh, so it's a smooth transition from from boost to boost back. Uh, so you don't really have an opportunity. You can't you can't ditch the the hot staging ring while those Raptors are thrusting. Um, but that's that's the big delta view maneuver for the return to to launch site. Uh, so it's you know I've I've seen some people like Aeneas express uh, surprise that they're ditching it so late, which is right before reentry, or you know sometime after boost back and before reentry. Mm -hmm. um, but it it wasn't surprising to me because I'd, I'd heard that it, there were aerodynamic uh, and thermal issues with the hot staging ring on the entry last time. Thermal, okay, so so everyone knows the, the hot staging ring is, is an extension up here. So it's, it's adding, this is a couple meters? I'm trying to remember how, how much it is to, to the top up yeah, there. Yeah, that's about right. So it's adding a little bit of mass. It's a couple of tons, isn't it? So it's, that uh, means it's you're- so, or so, so Okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna take the center of gravity and move it up a little bit higher, which means it's a little bit harder for these grid fins to operate so i mean heating okay that's a, a surprise that you would be hearing about heating i could say okay yeah i mean that that might be wrong perhaps? i might be misremembering or somebody yeah. may have misspoken there yeah. just these rumors of okay so yeah. so do you think it has some it's not so much that it's too heavy yeah, it might yeah, be it's that it's just throwing the off the stability mm -hmm. of everything of just you know because they designed this thing without the idea of the hot staging rings being there it's like this is the reason we could put yeah. the control fins there and now if you're moving it you're going to adjust that so yeah it's like, come on, you can you can handle that mass to land. It's not that you don't have enough yeah. rust. There's yeah, something yeah. else going on there. Okay. Yeah. So I, and I and this, take this kind of uh, also jives with what we've seen with their future plans for an integrated and hot staging ring that has the mm -hmm. grid fins built in. Which would make sense. Up. That makes but. sense. I, I just don't know how they pop that thing off because it's... <laughs> well, I guess they already they kind of already have the mechanical latching mechanism in there already because they didn't have it before, right? So they kind right. of have that design. Maybe they're just using that to clamp it on, but you're clamping the hot staging ring in basically two areas. 
And I'm just wondering, it's like, what about the mechanical integrity of that? Because, you know, it's not welded on anywhere. Uh, and and then you just don't pop the thing off. You've got to literally jettison it. You've got to do something to throw it away to now, make sure it actually doesn't come back. I'm I'm curious about that because mm -hmm. it's possible that the, that the ballistic coefficient of Drag, the yeah. rest of the booster is yeah. enough higher than... Uh, like high enough that you're going to get more enough drag to pull that pull, pull it away. away. So if you I get, just I get let go idea. on the way down, here's another it, idea. Ozan, you want to know what it is? Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> be. You think they'll do this imperfectly? <laughs> they'll just like. Woo! <laughs> that's, that's I mean, that's, one that's how they were going to do stage separation. In the beginning. Exactly. Kind of exactly. Disappointed that they that they didn't continue with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, they could do that. Um, I don't know that they will, but it, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a good chance that if you just unlatch it, it, it might. just happens to pull I don't know. separate it's, cleanly. On the other hand, it's it, it may not be so clean because you're coming in supersonic, so you, you don't you're not going to have a lot of I don't know how much tail drag you're going to have. Um, yeah, and and do you do it? You know, it's it's after the boost back, which means after the boost back, you're still. Yeah pretty much a way above the atmosphere and you don't have any drag up there. So that's one opportunity to do it in a zero drag environment. And right. then the other one, when you come back into drag and the question is who's coefficient yeah, if you can, is going if to be you worse. Get enough separation before you, you hit Atmo. Yeah. 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 That's fine. It, it'll, that's it, fine. They, they won't reconnect, but that, they, they, if they, you, they, they, yeah, if you try to use Atmo to separate it, then I don't, I don't know. It's, that's a little, just, yeah. I don't know if it pulls it away faster than the other or it pulls away and then it comes back. It's just, it's yeah and, and if, when that if wind it goes pulls off, away i don't think it's coming back yeah but well I mean, it, it, yeah like, hopefully, hopefully it's not but it, you just don't know if it tumbles or does something like that whether that sort of changes what's going on and you get those yeah the thing is i mean so you, you got by. that whole plate right so yeah. even if it tumbles like the smallest cross section that it has is close to 30 square meters mm -hmm. like 20 square meters and uh, versus 63 for the bottom of the booster and you know, add some to that for the for the grid fins, right? But that thing is they, like the booster is twenty times heavier or more than that hot staging ring. So whatever orientation it is, it's in. If it's getting any kind of decent um, exposure to to air, it yeah. will pull away from the booster. Right, so, right. Yeah. And if it starts to get a little bit of an angle, then it's really going to catch the inside, and then it's just going to. That would yeah. be right away. It might go sideways, but it'll definitely go back relative to the booster. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. And and once it's away, it should be all right. It's, it's just those first couple of seconds I'm worried about that there's a chance that it bumps into it. But uh, yeah, I think mean, that's enough on that topic. We can, we can move okay. on, Royden. Yeah. No, so I just um, very quickly, Ben and Ozan, if you want to uh, chime in on this. So it's very clear from what SpaceX has told us that the key focus for this is to stick the reentry um, and to just get get Starship back in one piece, and they've comp they've kind of focusing it on so much on it so much that uh, they're not kind of looking at other things like a restart of uh, of the engines. Uh, they're not looking at the 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 uh, the deployment door opening and closing. Yeah. They say they've pretty much uh, you know succeeded with both of those with IFT three, but it seems that like this is really the focus, right? If they don't stick it. If they don't stick the re-entry, this could complicate things a lot further for SpaceX. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that because I think a lot of the um, the economics of the Starship rely on on that landing and reuse. Uh, there's so many refueling flights that are, are going to be needed for some of these more ambitious missions that if they can't get, if they have to build a new rocket every single time they need to fly a tanker, then there's just no way any of these are going to work. So I, I agree with that. And I think it's, uh, you know, a big challenge for them. Um, so my take on that is that they've, I think that they've got substantial changes that they need to make to get Relight to work. I think that's the only mm -hmm. reason not to try Relight. Uh, the door, maybe they, I, I, I can see them being satisfied with the door, um, but, and, and, and waiting on having Relight before they try flying Starlinks. Um, but I I think the only reason not to relight is is if you think that it's going to fail, because that's a key thing that you you need to demonstrate, regardless, right? Um, and it's it's not something that prevents you from doing other things if you think that you have a decent chance of success. 
okay, f- fail in what way? Meaning that it ruds or it just doesn't start? Either one of those. Which, um, I mean, I, I, if it just doesn't there's, start. There's, some, there's, some, there's been some uh, SpaceX communication that makes me um, wonder if they're afraid of embarrassment in, in some areas. Okay. Um, they, they, the way that they've expressed some things or you know left some things um, unsaid, it. Um, yeah, I, I think that whether you have a red or a, a failure to to relight, it would. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that red it would be more. Hold on, real quick. The um, the relight is a failure on the vacuum engines, right? On the vacuum raptors, not the atmosphere. Be the sea level raptors that they would be relighting, as far as I know. Mm-hmm. At that point, the, the efficiency is not that critical, and the sea level ones are the ones that give you thrust vector control, and you mm-hmm. it's easier to light one than to light three at a time. Um, okay. So, if you're going to light light the vacuum raptors, you have to light all three, um, but they could just light one or two sea level raptors and have. Um, two or three degree of freedom attitude control with that. And that's what I imagine that they would do for orbital insertion and other orbital maneuvers that are high enough delta V that you you can't do it with RCS, Mm -hmm. which, I mean, this is something that they need to be able to deploy Starlink. That's something that they need to be able to do tanker rendezvous. Artemis needs it. Starlink needs it, right? They, they, they got, they have to get to it at some point, but I think that Mm -hmm. the current, that the ship that they that they're going to fly does not have the hardware ready for that, so they're they're trying to make the most of what they have. That's that's my guess. Hmm. Um, so it's almost like far, they're going for the the biggest ambitious goal that actually has a chance of succeeding. Yeah, so or just, or you know, I think they're going to try to get further with it. Right? They didn't mm-hmm. get good data out of the last one because the orientation was uh, was off. Um, they want to see how just how well the TPS does. I don't know that they have. a I, I think that their chances of actually making it all the way through a reentry are under 50%. I would love to be proven wrong. I think it would be great data either way, right? To be able to do a controlled reentry that's not <laughs> tumbling mm-hmm. uh, and, and see how far they get and, and where the hotspots are. If they can get that information, that's going to be really useful uh, for yeah. the program. Uh, as far and, as, and, and you know, whether you, you need... Huh? Why, why are you at 50%? I'm at below fifty percent. Below fifty percent, yeah. <laughs> because of the, the thermal protection system, like I, okay, it's, so it's, it's really hard to get it right the first time, and I don't think that they've like it's clear that they're not following a an engineering path that highly values getting it right the first time, and this is this is one area where there's so many opportunities for failure that it seems likely that something will give out, right? It could be a flap actuator that overheats. It could be um, uh, some hot spots where you get breakthrough heating, some tiles falling off in critical areas, all kinds of stuff that that could happen, that could cause it to you know not make it through reentry. And they're I, I think a, at they're least like a real, like a real life happen. Monte Carlo simulation. <laughs> they just like yeah. they put it, you know, whatever right. parameter could what? be crazy, and they'll just break everything. Well, yeah. in the in the report, they did talk about that. Uh, this when they had that rotisserie that was kind of going on there. So they were exposed on the protective side and the non-protective side, and they said they had overheating on both sides. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I understand on the unprotected side was getting overheating, but how are you getting overheating on the un- on the protected side? Do you have any theories on that? Do you think it was just conduction of the heat coming around from the unprotected side, or was it a failure of the of the protective system? I, th- I think the, the the orientation it could have messed it up, right? If you're coming in tail first or nose first for parts mm-hmm. of, uh, of of your entry phase, and you're um a you're not going to get lift and you're gonna, you're not going to get enough lift and you're going to end, end up in a more of a ballistic trajectory that's going to uh, put you in a steeper um descent than you intended right and that's going to cause greater heating because you're going to be getting okay. uh, higher atmos sooner and and b uh, the orientation itself could uh cause some spots that were expected to be covered enough to not be covered enough uh even though they are covered right like if mm-hmm. if you're hitting the um like if if you're hitting the nose or the or like the flap edges head on instead of at an angle that could that could cause excess heating 
Okay, so um, Scott, could you just for those who didn't, uh, you know, tune into our discussion yesterday, maybe could you just spend a minute uh, taking us through the big takeaways? Sorry, before we, I, 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 I do want to uh, yeah, go sure. there and hear what Scott has to say, but I, I did want to address this whole like does, does uh, SpaceX need uh, refilling? And I actually think that that um, in some ways it would be easier for them to meet both Artemis and Starlink goals if they dropped second stage reuse temporarily mm -hmm. um that's i know i realize that's a controversial opinion among uh spacex fans and and like i do appreciate that they're like uh all in on full reuse and i think that it, they, we do need to get there eventually but i actually don't think that there's a rush uh i you know if you go to partial reuse you can practically double the performance of of the stack the well, artemis landers have your, none of your them refills. are going to be reused anyway so right mm -hmm. yeah the, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, landers, landers, same, reuse. same with sls i mean right they, they and they can <laughs> build these stacks fast enough that yep. i mean if if you only need eight tankers or, or and you can reduce that tanker count as well if you get less ambitious on the on the lander i mean just reduce the number of barrels i mean reduce the number of <laughs> ring se sections yeah well remember there, there are ways tanker to back, cut then that down there's also you need fewer tankers if you don't have to worry about bringing them home exactly yeah 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 you can i mean you could be yeah, so, so something's so getting what do you think is a compelling factor? Why, why are they choosing this route then? Uh, well, I mean, this is, I, I think they're trying to get to Mars. I think they're, tr they're not just trying to get to Mars. I think they're trying to get humans to Mars in large numbers. And that's what you need full reuse for. There is no market right now that requires the, no, but hang on. So the, humans, the level humans of launch is... cost reduction that it, that necessitates full reuse. They Correct. can already hit an order of magnitude better than Falcon 9 with partially reusable Starship. Like this is something that they can do within a year or two or, or three if they yeah. if that's the direction that they want it to go. Because they could get to roughly Falcon 9 cost with 10 times the performance with the expendable upper stages using Starship infrastructure and, and, and hardware. Um, and that is like, they're already killing it right on launch. There's, there's, there's nothing that needs to fly right now. Um, that, that needs anywhere near the launch cost that they're aiming for of around like 10, $15 a kilo. Um, the only thing that needs that is, you know, large scale human infrastructure and, and human transit, transit, interplanetary and earth to earth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people think that's a pipe dream, but I think that that's, that's legitimately what they're gunning for. Yeah, but there is a business model. There is an existing, you know, business case to be made for, let's say, non-reusable starship right because mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. global launch market is so huge and remember you've got starlink to get out there and we look, we're looking yeah. at the next gen because if you want to get video calls from like sat to phone video calls across the world then you need to expand the starlink constellation and there's a lot of work that's still to be done on earth before you get to mars so i'm yeah. kind of confused about do you, why you feel they they think prioritizing taking humans to Mars takes precedence over the Earth business models. Well, I think uh, so. That's <laughs> I mean that's it's a very a it's a very philosophical question <laughs> that I, people have been asking of Elon for a long time, um, <laughs> and he has his justifications, and uh, yeah. he probably believes them. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't keep your eyes on the on the prize, then it's very easy oh, sure. to get complacent. Yeah. They did not need to do Starlink. They did not need to do uh starship they could have they could have been sitting pretty on falcon 9 right do you think the starlink uh, was really like his i felt like that was his uh fundraising effort to get to Mars. yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah, that's the, yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. the technology yeah. it's just uh yeah how do i get funds to do things yeah um yes Right, I mean, and, the subscription and, model at scale like that. But, where... but it's, it's more than that. I mean, he, he could have come up with, you know, some other business that just raised a ton of money that was sure. absolutely not related to space. But the thing is that this is a way of making a lot of money that also required you to use a lot of rockets with a really high yeah. cadence. Yeah. So yeah. basically, it kind was of like flywheel itself, that gave yeah. you the engineering. Yeah. That, that And that was like the brilliant part of the model. And I didn't mm -hmm. see Starlink coming out, of, you know, 
uh, it came out of left field for me. It's like, holy cow. I was like, oh, brilliant idea. It's so obvious now. <laughs> but at the time, I wasn't expecting it. I just thought, oh, they would pour capital in there. And I think Ozan is, is kind of right, is that if if you're looking at Mars and you're coming up with a certain architecture, and now that you've got that architecture, you're trying to build it and justify it for all these other things when it might not be quite right based on the time frames, the cost structures, and everything else. Ideally, we'd like to have everything that's reusable, mm -hmm. but it may be that it's too time prohibitive right now if you want to get back to the moon in a certain period of time. So yeah, yeah, which it, it I might think be that not your ambitions have to go back. Basically. Yes, right. Where is the priority exactly? The, the, I mean, the priority is building that capability to mm -hmm. put payload up to orbit at 10, 15, 20 oh, you could, dollars I mean, a kilo and like on, on the surface of Mars at, you know, hundred, two hundred uh, dollars a kilo. That is, that is the goal, right? It, well, and is, everything this is your else homework assignment. Is, is, is like in service of that. This is your homework assignment for next week is like, you know, really come up with a, a completely reusable tanker, you know, no, no grid fins on it. Just throw away all the Raptors, you know, the minimum amount of Raptors you need to get yourself into orbit. Oh, Would you change tanker? the size of the boosters a little bit? And then how many tankers does it take? Cause you know, right now they're saying what, maybe eight tankers. Would you get it down to That's four? Would possibly, you get down to possibly it's going to be 15. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard yeah, those weird numbers in, in, in there around there, but, but what Somewhere would four and 15 is the yeah because you don't need the header tanks anymore because you're not even thinking of coming home you, you don't need the heat protection system you're like yes. all these things you just absolutely don't need yeah that you're just putting one big tanker on up there that you know who knows it, it may be a very different kind of launch cadence and then maybe you change because right now they're stretching the starship right mm -hmm. because they're trying to reuse the, the lower boost a bit more because of of reusability but now if you like you turn that equation around, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, maybe the booster gets a bit higher. And then you get into like yeah. Tori Bruno and and that maybe this thing actually goes into Leo. <laughs> you wouldn't <laughs> want to have that discussion. I mean, if you <laughs> want to expand the booster, sure. You could you yeah. could also just have it be semi reusable You could do RTLS, you could do you could land those yeah. boosters. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that you can land them on their existing uh drum ship fleet with some minor modifications. Wow. Wow. Really you think? I, I yeah, I, think, and I, I, think, I think we launched something similar a while back too. Okay, because oh, it's wow. it's not it's not too heavy, right? Mm -hmm. The deck has to be able to support the amount of fire that you bring, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then it needs to be about like sixty percent uh, wider. But that's not it's not that hard to make legs long enough because you've already got a little bit of an advantage from having mm -hmm. uh, like, it's already sitting pretty wide, right? Right. Um, so slightly longer legs obviously a lot beefier uh, you know 10 times as massive and uh they're landing with enough precision that there's room on there and it can mm -hmm. support the weight I'm, I'm pretty pretty sure it can support the weight uh so it's just a matter of you know maybe you add a little bit of deck plating to uh so, so, so that it my, doesn't my classical covering is it. actually in uh, marine engineering naval architecture and like i have huge fears that scream in my mind when I think about like changing the mass and actually the height, uh, because then you're changing the the CG on the vessel, you have yeah. stability problems on the ship. I And I know the cost of building ships is actually lower than pulling in-service ships out and refitting them. So okay. I would think that they would probably just build new ones. They could build new ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that like the, the landed mass of that thing is about 5% of the mass of, uh, uh, of the, of those barges. Okay. And the, those barges are, I can't remember how, how wide they are. I think they might be like 150, 200 feet wide. They're um, big. Yeah, they're definitely big. So I don't, I don't think that you have a lot of tip over risk. Probably not. Um, I, I would have, I would have to know a little bit more about them, um, you know, you yeah. know, like a sailboat, if you think about it, you have this, because you have this high uh, moment of inertia right. on it, you have this, you know, keel that goes down below the surface of the water by another 20 feet or so that's got a big, massive amount of concrete at the bottom uh, to mm -hmm. counterbalance it. And still, if you look at the America's Cup boats, they flip over. Um, right. My worry would be like, if you come in at an off angle with the a much heavier, much taller rocket, you would have a similar effect. Yeah, would it would it flip? I I don't know, but um, do they would they need more of these drone ships to land on if there were certain land starships on them? Probably, and I think they should they would would probably just build new ones or yeah, they I mean they might ones, but um, I think that like the, sh the 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 shape of the underside of those deck barges is such that it's 
it's not it's not like a, a, a like a, it's, it's probably a flatter track. bottom. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely not a racing hole. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably flatter bottom, but um, you know, I've, I've even seen videos of some of the catamarans flipping over, uh, and I, okay. so I guess yeah, there's some of the. Um, I think there would be some uh, some analysis that needs to be done before you right. get, decide to start doing that. Yeah. It might be possible, but uh, it might be cheaper to. Now you, uh, you worried about it after it lands, or you worry about when it's underway? Because you just put the wing keel underneath there, and that that ought to give you yeah. stability. But you got to be moving for it to work. If, if you're stationary, that that keel doesn't really help much at all. Except unless it's mass. really deep. <laughs> yeah, unless it's really deep, but you know, yeah. it's it's really yeah, the, the the forces that are generated as you're moving through the water that helps yep. you generate that stability. Stage one landing confirmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then you have to add legs to it. So so okay, so so no cheating here, Ozan. It's it's just like it, it can't have legs, so it has to be re returned to launch site. And okay. you know, just really thinking about it, it's like, you know, what would be the cargo difference? Of, well, of being I mean, if you just want to do a tanker and forget the header tanks, just do a, a full, yeah. Uh, just yeah. fill up. You, you don't need to stretch it, just fill the whole thing with propellants. That's going to be at two, two kilotons. It's going to stage a little earlier. Um, you can keep the same Raptor configuration that you already have. Uh, hey, Ozan, we, we should try to talk minimize. a little bit more into, you know, you mentioned somewhere between four and 15 tanker flights. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that's an interesting subject to talk to a little <laughs> bit. Uh, and I think you know a lot more than I do on it. I, I've just seen, you know, the, the most recent NASA report that came through that said 15. Um, yeah. And admittedly, I didn't read the entire thing, but it's interesting how that number has grown over the last five years or four years. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So it started with 14, right? And then at some point we heard it could be high teens. And then mm -hmm. we heard... Uh, 10 ish. Then we heard 15. Earlier on, we heard four to eight from Elon. Um, there are just so many variables sure. that impact it. Which Raptors you use, whether or not you use Raptors for certain phases of flight, or you use the hot gas thrusters. Do you even have hot gas thrusters, or are you just using Raptors? Um, how much to do the various components weigh that you are going to take be taking to to the moon, the the, the, the crew cabin? Okay, uh, let, let's break this down for a second. Yeah. This this is the tanker, and this is also the lander. They're basically the same thing as far as size, but they're configured a little bit different. The, so the lander has a big cargo bay up in here. Mm -hmm. So that's all the stuff you bring to the moon, which means you've got about that much actual propellant mass down here. And it's got just enough propellant mass to get it up into low Earth orbit. And then it's just sitting there basically stranded because it's empty and it needs a refill. So now we're going to start sending these cargo tankers on up there. And the cargo tankers, basically, if it's going to be completely expendable, I means that whole thing is, is gasoline, all right, <laughs> that we're bringing it up there. So if it's 15 tankers, it means by the time that thing gets up there, it's so fully depleted, it barely get anything in there. So that, that's what I'm trying to understand is like, how can we get up there and then suddenly have like no cargo? Um, so is, is that ratio just seems really weird to me yeah. in that, you know, how, how can a cargo tanker just not have what's needed when you finally get there? I mean, you know, there, there must be a more efficient way of doing it, not having to have 15 launches. It seems it's like calling a family car a tanker and using that to deliver gas to your gas station <laughs> almost, you know, like. yeah, that's what it almost seems like it, it's, 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 it's so, so by the time you get, cause I understand you, you're getting up in the orbit and you're bringing some cargo with you. But if your cargo is actually the fuel, yep. then it seems like you should do a decent job getting up there. It's hard to believe that it's got it's expending that much when it's going up. And part of it, I understand, is because you're thinking of returning. It's really heavy. You get all this other stuff. If you make it, and in, in that case, yeah, I could see why the numbers might be really high because you're really stretching the margins. But could there be other things in that? Can we somehow get in a low enough orbit, and then you have some other mechanism that raises the orbit? You know, get the delta v up mm. there or something more so efficient. Getting the orbit, getting to orbit, is the hardest part of the job, and it is mm. most efficient to uh, refill as as close to as, the lowest possible stable orbit as you can get away with. It also offers better MMOT protection, mm -hmm. um, slightly higher uh, boil off concerns, uh, but I mean, just to get problem. the orbit, this yeah. this thing needs to put in over six kilometers per second of delta V with 
roughly three and a half kilometers per, per second effective exhaust velocity. So whatever you do, most of your propellant, most of the propellant that that's that, that it starts out with is going to be depleted by the time that you get there. Now, getting there with good enough mass fractions that you can return is indeed very difficult as the shuttle pro proved. Like it wasn't even trying to, it, did, it didn't even try to uh, bring back its uh, propellant it tanks, right? And even so, its its payload was, uh, you know, like a quarter of its dry mass, or a third at best, right? Um, this thing is trying to do better than that with full reuse and and uh, bringing back its tanks and mm -hmm. and quick refurb. Right. So it's a huge challenge. I agree that if you were staging higher, it would be easier. Um, if obviously, if you weren't uh, if it was ex expendable, you you know th th that would shift, right? So you might be able to get 200 tons of propellant up there with a 60 ton, uh, with a 60 ton second stage, or something like that, or you know higher higher numbers for future upgrades. Right. So I think that when it comes to Artemis, uh, there are a couple of there there are two big areas, one uh, that that really impact performance. One of them is how much propellant can you get up there per tanker? That's that's the big question. And some people have said uh, 80 tons, 100 tons. We know that the first prototype, uh, you know, we've heard murmurings of 40 tons, 50, 50 tons. I don't think that that's, that would be applicable to a tanker variant that would hold two kilotons of propellant to start out with, should be able to perform better. Um, but, you know, it could be a low number. Um, but we've also heard that they, they want to eventually get to 200 tons. You do not need, you know, 15, 200 ton propellant runs in order to get this thing to, to the move, right? So that's that's factor one. Uh, factor two is just uh, what is the efficiency of that moon route? And the biggest mm -hmm. element of that is your uh, your lander mass. And both your tanker performance and your your lander mass or sorry, both your tanker performance and, and your landing efficiency are dramatically Im impacted by you know, the underlying dry mass of the, of the Starship that you're, you're building all this on top of, right? So if you, if that increases by 20, 30, 40%, that cuts in, that, that both increases uh, the amount of propellant that you need by about that much and also uh, reduces the propellant that you can get per tanker. So it just kind of has this, uh, compounding impact that that can dramatically increase the number of refills that that you need. So early variants with with the mass growth that has happened that they didn't want, but that seems mm -hmm. to have happened. Yeah, I mean, I think if they can get get it under fifteen, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's theoretically possible to get to four. And uh, I say that the, the final question on that is what fraction of the propellant can actually transfer from one vehicle to another? Because it's not like gasoline where you yes. just like siphon one guy's tank over the other. I just imagine <laughs> yeah. that there's like a lot of leftovers that is like, mm, that's it. You know, it's yeah. how do you get it done over in zero G? You know, yeah, vacuum. I mean, if if it's, you, you should be able to get it down to residuals, mm -hmm. right? So all of it in theory, but then you also need to expend some of it to, for the transfer to to have that um, basically artificial gravity uh, for for settling, so that that depends on just how much you need, how much how much uh, acceleration you need uh, for a clean transfer, and how how fast you can do the transfer. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole there. That's <laughs> 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 yeah, an interesting I one. For sure. time, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Rambled. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick around for another five ten minutes. Yeah, you better. <laughs> <laughs> okay so listen for, for, for those who uh, who are looking now at uh, IFT4 uh, Scott can you just give us um, like the, the big picture view what are the top three things that we we should be looking out for with IFT4 what's the target okay the, the, the main thing is they've trimmed out let's say all the excess fat and they just want to prove that they can get the thing up there and bring both pieces home um, so they're really focusing on that uh, with a couple of changes that like we've talked about, they're jettisoning uh, the ring. They're not going to be doing anything else in orbit. 
They're not going to try to open up the payload bay doors or do a full trans fuel transfer or anything else like that. They've added some additional attitude control jets on there for redundancy because of the potential blockages that, or clogging that they've been getting uh, in, in the RCS thrusters, which is a bit of a mystery. So I think that the main thing is they've decided to not be overly ambitious uh, and just go ahead for that. So it should be very similar to IFT3, uh, except they want to make sure that they hit all the goals. And now they are probably not going to land in the Indian Ocean. They're going to they're going to belly flop out there somewhere, but they want to be able to come through the atmosphere intact and actually have it rud on impact in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to do a soft landing. And in the Caribbean, they want to do a soft water landing of the booster. And then I believe it then sinks uh, right after that. They're not going to do a recovery. OK, well, um, let's move on. We've got uh, a lot of other things happening and um, Boeing Starliner. It's, uh, we don't know where it is on the horizon. Yeah, now, while I mean, there, they were like hours or now, apart. You know? or now. On, yeah, on one of the the, um, the launch sites, they had them like a couple hours apart. And now we know, in theory, Starliner might go before um, Starship. Mm -hmm. But what do you think are the chances those on? I genuinely don't know. Uh, I think... I, 50 50. <laughs> um, I think both could be delayed further right now. It's it's mm -hmm. looking like it's they're aiming for the first second and then the fifth. I don't know what the what the time on the fifth is probably later. So if they if they mm -hmm. end up if, if they miss the first and the second, then then it might be later. Uh, but also they might just find something that uh, does away with their flight rationale and then they have to pull it in. And then I think if it's later than the fifth, then they're looking at uh, well, I don't know how much time that they, they have, but there is a concern that uh, there's some there are components that uh, uh, that would need to be that would require. They have a shelf back. life, yeah. So, so I, I think the uh, uh, what the flight termination system usually yeah, has an yeah, expiration right. date on it, which might be to like the end of June or something like that. But it's going to be like Artemis all over again. If it's sitting out there too long, they got to bring it back in and then yeah. check all these components. So it's it's this compounding problem that if they don't really get it going quickly, and of course the, the one thing about Starship is that they're still waiting on FAA approval. So that's why that fifth is kind of conditional, but it could be also conditional engineering. The thing that just seems so strange about what's going on with Starliner is it was like this innocuous kind of helium leak that it seems like, oh, they yeah. should have patched it up and like been ready to go within two days. And it seemed to be a lot more than that. And then they started discovering all these other problems Something right. absolutely unrelated. It's like, well, wait a minute. You're discovering that now. You should discover yeah. that before you were like an hour away from actually launching this thing. So, kind of um, reminds me of their first yeah. orbital test flight, where it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. there was this one thing you knew about, and oh, by the way, there are these other issues that uh -huh. uh, you never, yeah. you didn't notice. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting way to per, to you know present that. Yeah, and uh, I I just don't know what else is going to pop up. You know, between yeah. here and I mean, there. And, and there, there have been so many cycles of oh, okay. Now NASA is looking at it, and it's not just up to Boeing, and mm -hmm. it's gonna, it's gonna get good now, and <laughs> it doesn't seem to end. <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, I, I walked in on projects yeah. that were yeah. that were in that were done sure. a certain way, and getting them to not be a certain way <laughs> always <laughs> required ten times the effort that management yeah. <laughs> hoped for. Yeah. 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 And so, remember, the scrub had nothing to do with Starliner, right? Yeah, the, the first one, right? Well, the first, first one, one was the first in, one. and then uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This this, this, this this scrub yeah. with the hydrogen leak was really completely something completely unrelated to it. From my understanding, yeah. wasn't it uh, more of a, a, U, a ULA uh, problem? Yeah, there was there was um, a yeah. ULA scrub there. Yeah, uh, then there was the set. The helium one was the second scrub yeah, after was, that. Yes. Um, yeah, and yeah. the interesting part the is the drama that's popping up from their valve supplier, you know, and. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, is there was shifting blame. Yeah, there. Yeah, the valve suppliers, you know, um, released a, a public statement urging uh, NASA not to launch it. Um, you know, uh -huh. Boeing in the meantime is saying like, "Shut up, everything's fine." Uh, it was. It's just very interesting. Um, and I, I don't know. I I think the value of of it of Starliner itself is probably in question, especially considering that after this, they won't be able to launch on Atlas fives anymore anyway. Um, so is this really like, yeah, you know, how should we just call our losses, you know, call the couple billion dollars 
spent on this uh, a loss and then move on with their lives. Yeah, I, I think the, the only thing I, I would pick up on that, Ben, is that the, the reason for the Starliner is it has the capability to reboost ISS, which is something you cannot do with Dragon. So mm -hmm. that's like the one advantage it has over it. But that goes into the next thing, and that is um, Sierra Nevada. Is it Sierra Nevada? Yeah. <laughs> is yeah. it, that the Dream Chaser is does have that capability. So it does sort of make sense that if that's coming online and you're really sure it's going to be coming online, the only thing is that do they have a launch vehicle? I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? Good question. Oh, Sierra? Sierra, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Vulcan's yeah, Sierra's Sierra's going up on Vulcan, Vulcan right? I, I don't think that there's a concern there, but uh, I don't know that Dream Chaser is going to be ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's ready to attempt a flight. Starliner was ready to attempt the flight four years ago, and then all these issues have come up since then. Like we don't actually know what state Dream Chaser is. Chaser is mm -hmm. right. Like everybody loves Sierra, and I'm yeah. rooting for them too. But like we don't we don't know how good that vehicle actually is. But I will say that that vehicle we've been waiting for that vehicle for literally 20 years. That was announced in 2004. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why it's called a dream chaser <laughs> <laughs> it's it's beautiful it will offer awesome capabilities but i so, don't think that so we this should is, this is just uh, a cargo a cargo transport vehicle right it's not for, for now a, yeah for crew, originally for it was now. supposed to be a crew vehicle yeah then it got there were some concerns and it got turned into a cargo vehicle uh and there's a version two that's supposed to be a, a crew vehicle that Sierra wants to develop, and Blue Origin has act, actually basically baselined it for orbital leave. Okay, cool. All right, so um, uh, just uh, you know, I I can't help but wonder how much the Boeing Starliner uh, test launch is complicated by the fact that you have two humans that will be on board that uh, that spacecraft. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, if if it was just a, a you know. A spacecraft going up with just cargo, of course, it would be a different um, yeah. risk profile, right? You yeah. can't go wrong with. I mean, it just—it's very difficult to recover from from something from yeah. an accident where where humans are involved. Yeah, so I and, guess and, that's. Yeah, just look at how <laughs> Boeing is doing with their recent human-involved accidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. devastating exactly. for them. They can't exactly. afford another one. Now, yeah. now o Ozan, I'm going to ask you a piece of trivia here regarding uh, Sunita Williams. Do you know where she went to high school? <laughs> I I think I heard you say that it, 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 she went to your high school. Is that My right? high school. And, and do you know what the, the motto of the high school was? What, what what or the mascot of the high school? I don't. I don't. What was it? It is and always has been the Rockets. Oh, that's cool. Oh, nice. way before you went there. And I think it's because we actually have Nike sites or former Nike sites in Needham that was, I guess, to protect Boston from <laughs> thermonuclear annihilation. So I think well, that's where the term the rockets came from. Nice. So yeah, she graduated years after I, I was there, but I was just kind of surprised that, wow, someone from my high, high school made it into space and it wasn't me. <laughs> well, that's awesome. All right. Well, um, I think it's, it's, uh, been a good first attempt at um, a kind of a roundup, a weekly roundup. It's it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, let me just uh, pull up your social media profile so people can know where to reach out to you. This is Scott on X, Ben, and of course Ozan. And um, you know we've got a lot more. Uh, we could have packed in a lot more, but I think we it's better to start slow and not bite off more than we can chew. <laughs> and maybe next time we'll uh, talk about this. So much to talk about with the Orion heat shield. Maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah. Mars helicopters uh, and the infrastructure was also. And of course, um, you never know what happens next. So until next week, at least for now, we'll have to wrap this up. Thanks, guys. It's been wonderful having you. It's been good, good being here.